All right, welcome everyone to another uh, interview. Uh, today I have Dr. Stephen Gundry. Super excited for this interview. This is a, a life-changing person who's been in this industry for uh, a few decades and specializes in autoimmune disease and has helped thousands of people recover from chronic diseases that are supposedly uh, incurable or cannot be changed. I used to be professor and chairman of cardiothoracic surgery and pediatrics at Loma Linda University School of Medicine. Resigned my position uh, after watching a gentleman clean out his coronary artery disease with uh, food and supplements from a health food store. And uh, I thought that was probably the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And so I had um, I had a special major at Yale University long ago where I looked at the how humans evolved eating certain plants and how they evolved not eating other plants. I happened to notice that their diabetes went away, their hypertension went away, their arthritis went away. So I started playing with why the immune system was so interested in these people. Mm -hmm. And um, that eventually resulted... Um, about a year and a half ago in the publication of The Plant Paradox, yep, which has spent 32 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. And it spends so much time on the bestseller list because it quite frankly works. It's good. And I was lucky enough to see a lot of patients with uh, the whole gamut of autoimmune diseases, but also Crohn's and colitis. And a lot of them have been everywhere. They're on immunosuppressants. They've been to university centers. And all we do is ask them to take away certain foods from their diet that they assume are healthy. Yep. Because most of their docs have told them that this is a genetic problem, that food really has nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, I'm now convinced that food has everything to do with it. So uh, Dr. Gundry, what for everyone out there who's wondering what the plant paradox is, which is the name of your book, uh, what does that mean, the plant paradox? Well, believe it or not, uh, plants were here first. They have a life. They are subject to evolutionary pressures just like animals. They want to grow, and they want to have babies, their seeds, and they want their seeds to grow. Mm -hmm. And the problem for plants when animals arrived is that they – did not have a typical animal defense system of being able to run, hide, or fight. But plants are chemists of incredible ability. Mm -hmm. So they use biologic chemical warfare against being eaten. And so plants do not want to be eaten. And that's the fundamental principle. Now, there are plants that want you to eat, for instance, their fruit so that they're babies, the seeds will be undigestible and you will poop their babies out someplace else with a generous dollop of fertilizer. Mm -hmm. But there are other plant seeds and plants that actually, what I call naked babies, they don't have a hard protection. Mm -hmm. A lectin is a protein mm -hmm. that is a sticky protein. They actually flip a switch and make the tight junctions that hold these cells together break. And when these junctions are broken, what happens is that these foreign proteins, lectins, get through the wall of our gut, and also bacterial particles and living bacteria get through the wall of our gut. Now, on the other side of our gut wall is our immune system. And about 65% of all of our white blood cells are massed along this border. In our gut. In our gut. And, mm -hmm. the gut, and the gut is actually about the same surface area as a tennis court. Wow. And the, yeah. And the lining of our gut is only one cell thick. And so you have this very, very, very thin wall trying to protect you, and yet it's only one cell thick. And then you've got your immune system on the other side. So when you get a leaky gut, and I can guarantee you that all Crohn's patients, all colitis patients have a leaky gut, mm -hmm. your immune system amasses at the border, mm -hmm. and 
they go on to threat level five, they amass the troops at the border, they scramble the fighter jets, and there is a war that takes place at the border. It starts with everybody with this penetration of the gut wall. And, and that's, that's interesting. So for anyone out there who's, who's wondering, okay, what does that mean? How these plants? Well, we know that certain animals have poison, like certain frogs. If you eat the frog, the animal can get poisoned from eating the frog. It's a natural evolutionary defense mechanism. So why don't we think that plants who are actually older and been here longer don't have similar defense mechanisms around being eaten? Well, I know that me and 99% of my clients have had issues eating grains, beans, nuts, seeds and every time we eat these we get tend to have more problems bloating flagellants bloody bowel movements running to the bathroom in five seconds it's like man whatever i ate i just couldn't eat that so can you shed some light on why that might be interestingly ten thousand years ago the normal human was about six feet tall and our brain size was about 15 percent bigger than it is today mm. by two thousand years into evolution into agriculture uh we shrunk about a foot, and our brain size shrunk 15%. We've obviously caught up in height, but our brain is actually still smaller than it was 10,000 years ago. Mm. And so we've really paid a price for grains and beans particularly. We're all from Africa, Asia, or Europe, and none of us were exposed to a plant from the Americas until 500 years ago when Colombian trade started. Mm -hmm. And some of our favorite foods are actually some of our most lethal. Uh, the nightshade family, like potatoes, eggplant, peppers, goji berries, mm -hmm. uh, tomatoes. These are nightshades from the Americas, and they're some of the most mischievous ones. Mm -hmm. Also, the squash family, zucchini, pumpkins are also from the Americas. And two nuts, which are not nuts at all, peanuts and cashews. So and the other seeds from the Americas are chia seeds, sunflower seeds, and pumpkin seeds. And there's two studies show that chia seeds promote inflammation in humans. Um, this was thought to me by Lauren Cordain, the father of the paleo diet. Mm. So all these healthy foods are actually not natural to humans. So if yeah. someone is a, a, a vegan and they're saying, well, I, I'm eating grains, I'm eating beans, that's how I wanna live, can they still, uh, what can they do to help mitigate these risks? And the important thing for vegans to realize is that some of their, quote, most important foods are the foods that are making them the sickest. So there, there are two grains that are perfectly safe. Uh, there's millet, and sorghum, they don't have lectins. So mm -hmm. that's an easy change. The other important thing is you can pressure cook beans and destroy lectins. And there's even a company, I have no affiliation with them, called Eden Beans, E-D-E-N. Mm -hmm. They pressure cook all of their beans in the can. And it has BPA-free uh, lining. Last I look, a horse doesn't eat grains and beans because he eats grass and has plenty of muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept that vegans and vegetarians have to get their nutrition or their protein from grains and beans is just not true. Next question for you, Dr. Gundry. Uh, what is, is gluten always bad? You know, this is something I think is a really important conversation because, you know, I'm gluten free. I teach most of my clients to be gluten free as well. And it's really to mitigate danger. It's a lot easier just to say, get rid of it until we get your symptoms down, we get your CRP levels right, your cytokines look good, then we can start opening it up, right? It's just easier to do an elimination diet. But uh, for someone who's out there who's, I would say, for, you know, everyone listening, who's already getting great results, who's got their bowels under control, who's, who's going along farther. What are your thoughts on, on, on gluten? So gluten is a lectin. It actually is a fairly minor lectin in the scheme of things. And in fact, most of the gluten-free foods like corn and brown rice and quinoa have far more lectins than the gluten that's being replaced. Mm -hmm. So... I don't, that doesn't mean go eat gluten and avoid the gluten-free. That isn't what I'm saying. 
We actually have bacteria that eat gluten, like gluten, but interestingly, when you stop eating gluten, they have nothing that they're interested in eating and they actually leave. So I think the point is, particularly in colitis, you gotta, you gotta get rid of gluten. We need to continuously uh, have beneficial bacteria things within us, but more importantly, which to reiterate what you talked about not eating before, is to eat, uh, is, it's more important what you're not eating, getting things out of your body so your body can naturally flourish. Right? One thing I like to say to people is, sometimes fasting can be the fastest way to heal. Moving on, what about dairy? I know that dairy has hit, you had some big problems in the last few years. Almost everyone's dairy free. Uh, you know, the ideas of it, do we need it for calcium? Do we need it for protein? Um, all of that. And, you know, you had a really good point about the type of dairy, where it's, it's from. And basically it's breaking down to, is it an A1 cow or A2? Can you shed some light on that uh, philosophy? Yeah. So, um, Northern European cows suffered a genetic mutation. The normal protein is casein A2. It's present in goats, sheep, water buffalo. Mm -hmm. It's also present now in Southern European cows, France, Italy, and Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Casein A1 cows, the Holstein cow, the black and white cow, are hardier and they give more milk. So that almost all cows in the world now are casein A1 cows, including ours, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. So we've found, and others have found, that casein A1 is a lectin-like protein that can become a fairly nasty molecule called beta caseomorphine that can attack your pancreas. Most people who think they're allergic to cow milk or that they get mucus with cow milk or they're lactose intolerant. It's actually an intolerance to casein A1. Cheeses from France, Italy, or Switzerland are usually safe. What you don't want to do is don't get a raw cheese from America because the odds are it's the wrong cow. A lot of times we're needing to use digestive enzymes or just straight the tame um, hydrochloric acid. What are your thoughts on using digestive enzymes to aid in, in this recovery? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I, I make my own product called Total Restore, which has a lot of this, uh, along with, you know, betaine is great. Most people do have low levels of hydrochloric acid. And one of the things that's important to remember is that acid in our stomach is one of the ways we first break down lectin proteins. Mm -hmm. If you don't have enough acid in your stomach, a lot of these proteins will get right on through. And we see a number of people who the problem started when their well-meaning doctor put them on Nexium or Prilosec for heartburn problems yeah. and destroyed the acid in their stomach. And their heartburn, believe it or not, was caused by lectins in the first place. And now they've unleashed the lectins because they have no acid in their stomach. Plus, it totally changes the gut microbiome. Mm. Mm, okay, so using digestive enzymes can be very helpful in this process to, you know, your, your furnace, making sure that what you're eating is getting broken down properly. And that can be a major difference of why Crohn's or colitis patients are so intolerable of food is they simply just can't digest it. What about another big one right now is the idea of probiotics and prebiotics, which is probably the most argumentative, contradictive uh, topic right now in natural medicine is what is a good probiotic? versus a bad probiotic? And are they very useful? And, and what is their role in the gut? Uh, can you shed some light on how probiotics or prebiotics can be used for people with Crohn's and colitis? Yeah, so the even good bacteria can be bad if you got a leaky gut, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So what, what I like to do um, is not so much worry about probiotics, although if you're going to use probiotics, I like probiotics that are actually going to get into the gut. The mm -hmm. vast majority of probiotics, which are friendly bacteria, are destroyed by stomach acid. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like spore-forming uh, probiotics. I have one in my Vital Reds and Primal Plants formula mm -hmm. called B30, but anybody can get it at a drugstore mm -hmm. uh, called Shift Digestive Advantage. But more importantly is you've got to give good bacteria the things they like to eat. 
and those are prebiotics. I wish no, I wish they hadn't ever made up these names because they are confusing. Yeah. So prebiotic is fertilizer for good bacteria. You've got to feed these guys, otherwise they leave. And there are some great supplements as well that have prebiotics. For instance, inulin is a great prebiotic. Flaxseed is a great prebiotic. Psyllium powder is a great prebiotic. Mm. So those are just examples. Um, yeah. mm. So that's what you want to do. To kind of wrap all this stuff up, Dr. Gundry, um, you've worked with a lot of people with Crohn's and colitis. And for everyone out there who's listening who maybe doesn't have the resources to come into your office and work with you one-on-one or work one-on-one with me or, or just wants to know what are some stuff I can implement today, um, what are the three, maybe what are three pieces of advice you would give to someone out there who is listening, who's, who's struggling with this? Um, what are some things you would, you would, uh, recommend them to do? So, uh, I want you to eat like it's 9,999 years ago. There were <laughs> no beans. There were no beans. There were no nightshades. Yeah. Uh, so it tastes like crap. It's, it's made over a fire and, you know. Well, yeah, and believe it or not, Jack Lane, who I had the pleasure of knowing, uh, always used to say, if it tastes good, spit it out. (laughs) We made it almost to 97. Cookbook, the Plant Paradox Cookbook, was on the New York Times bestseller list for four months. It's got 100 recipes, I mean, waffles, cookies, all sorts of great stuff. Second thing is you got to take a lot of vitamin D. Third thing is take a lot of fish oil. So those are the those are the three big things. I love it, Dr. Gundry. Thank you so much. This is very helpful. Uh, I know that you're going to help a lot of people with these types of uh, uh, strategies and philosophy, and I'm very thankful for your time today. All right, thanks a lot for having me. Thank you.